Chapel another week, and uh, I'm just really excited to introduce our chapel speaker today, Mr. Uh, Dylan Borkland. So I'm just going to pass it over to you, sir. Uh, I'll start. Uh, maybe we should uh, uh, say all this together. My last name is pr it's pronounced Bjorklund. <laughs> I know that's complicated, so uh, I'll give you some grace there. But uh, hey, I appreciate the invite, uh, being able to share with you. Um, but uh, yeah, um, uh, to, uh, today I'm really uh, just uh, this weekend um, I'm preaching on 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the first 11 verses about the gospel. Uh, Paul wants to remind the Corinthians about the gospel, uh, and it just got me thinking about a message uh, to share with you guys as well. Uh, so I wanted to start out, uh, just imagine uh, a game without any rules. Imagine a, a language whose words have no definite meaning. What would the result be? Confusion. A football game with no explanation of what to do with the pigskin uh, would leave a coach uncertain what to tell his team. A basketball game with officials who have no guiding rule book would result in muddled calls. There's a reason organized games have a rule book, a clear explanation of the game. There's a reason words have a definite meaning. Without it, language would be meaningless. We wouldn't be able to communicate. Clarity and agreement on the terms in a game, both teams understand the rules and agree to, to play by them. In conversation, two people understand the same language so that they're able to communicate. Without the clarity and agreement, there wouldn't be a real game, a real conversation. We know clarity and agreement are necessary, and it's not any different in the church. In order for the church to be effective, we need to have some clarity and agreement on some terms. Baptism, for example, means immersion, not sprinkling, and not pouring, dunking. Elders, as the overseers of the church, not one man, not a board, a plurality of qualified set-apart men to shepherd the flock. Clarity around terms and agreement of those terms are a must if the church is going to be effective. And today, I want to get some clarity around the gospel that we preach. Because the gospel that we preach determines the disciples that we make. Let me say that again. The gospel that we preach determines the disciples that we make. Maybe you've heard it like this. What you win them with is what you'll keep them with. The gospel we preach determines the disciples we make. And so I just want to ask you, what kind of disciples are you making? Those in your church, those whom you're discipling to follow Jesus, those whom you're evangelizing, those whom you are edifying, what kind of disciples are you making? Which leads to the important matter at hand. What kind of gospel are you preaching? You remember what Paul said, right? Over in 2 Corinthians, for if someone comes to you and preaches G another Jesus other than the Jesus we preach, or if you receive a different spirit from the spirit you received or a different gospel from the one you accepted, and then he concludes down in verse 5, their end will be what their actions deserve. Or Paul warns the Galatians of the danger of deserting the one who called us and turning to a different gospel. And just so you know, there, there is a lot of counterfeit gospels out there, right? There's the health and wealth gospel. There's the social justice gospel. There's the workspace gospel, the love wins gospel, the self-help gospel. You've probably heard some of these before. The health and wealth gospel. Give me your money. Donate your, your, your money to our, my ministry or to this church, and you'll receive tenfold back and be healed of all your infirmities. But Jesus never promised a pain-free, wealthy life for his followers. He said, in this world, you'll have trouble. The word says those who want to get rich fall into temptation, a trap, and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. The health and wealth gospel is not the real true gospel. The social justice gospel, the one that's buying a lot of denominations' attention, where sin is not the root problem, but rather social structures, that the cross was not a vicarious atonement, but only a moral example of how to treat your neighbor, 
It's a gospel that robs the true gospel of its very core and foundational truths. Then there's the works-based gospel, which, brothers, I'm sad to say, sometimes creeps its way into our churches. A gospel that says you may be saved by your by grace, but you're kept by your good works, your faithful living. But Paul said over Galatians 3, are you so foolish, having begun by the Spirit, are you now being perfected by the flesh? Then there's the love wins gospel. I'm starting to hear this one more and more. It's a message of universalism, that in the end, everyone will be saved because God is love. How can a loving God send his creatures whom he loves to hell? But Romans says, see the kindness and severity of God. To those who fell, severity. But to you, God's kindness, if you continue in his kindness, for otherwise you too will be cut off. And then there's this self-help gospel that's being preached on many stages on Sunday morning. It's all about having the good life. It models more of a TED talk than expository preaching. And scripture is sprinkled in when it helps the speaker to make his point. So what gospel are you preaching? Because the gospel you preach determines the disciples you make. The gospel of the apostles was about the lordship of Christ. I want you to go through the book of Acts with me this afternoon. Let's start in Acts chapter 2. Peter preaches the very first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, and before he gets to all of our favorite verse, he concludes his sermon by saying, Therefore let all the house of Israel know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. The crucified Jesus as Lord and Christ. That was the message on Pentecost. Then, if we go over to Acts in chapter 8, the church is scattered because persecution broke out. And as they go, look at their message down in verses 4 and 5. Therefore, those who have been scattered went through places preaching the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria and began proclaiming the Christ to them. What did he proclaim? The Christ. Acts 9. Saul the persecutor becomes Paul the preacher after his Damascus road call and the subsequent conversion. And we're told of the message that he preached down in verse 22. Saul kept increasing in strength and confounding Jews who lived in Damascus by proving that this Jesus is the Christ. The message was simple. Jesus is the Christ. Acts 17, on his missionary journey, Paul is preaching the same message. Matter of fact, we're told it was his custom. Verses 2 and 3, according to Paul's custom, he visited them and for three Sabbaths reasoned with them from the scriptures, explaining and giving evidence that the Christ had to suffer and rise from the dead and saying, this Jesus, whom I am proclaiming to you, is the Christ. This Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you, is the Christ. Acts 18, one chapter over. Different town, same message. Verse 5, when Silas and Timothy came down from Macedonia, Paul began devoting himself completely to the word, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Christ. Then if you look down in verses 27 and 28, and when he went uh, to go across to Achaia, the brothers encouraged him and wrote to the disciples to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who have believed through grace, for he powerfully refuted Jews in public, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. Jesus was the Christ. Do you see their message? God has made Jesus Lord in Christ proclaiming the Christ, proving that Jesus is the Christ. This Jesus whom I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ, testifying that Jesus was the Christ, demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. You cannot preach the gospel of the scriptures. You cannot preach the gospel of the apostles and leave out the central message that Jesus is the Christ. That's the message. Paul said it clearly in 1 Corinthians we preach Christ and him crucified. There's something about preaching the Christ that was central to the pure 
first century apostolic scriptural gospel. So it's worth getting some clarity here. Let's make sure that we all agree on the term. The word Christ, the Greek term, or Messiah, the Hebrew term, pertains to oil. In the Old Testament, prophets, priests, and kings were anointed with that holy fluid oil in order to be set apart for special purposes and services. Now, to say that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, is to say that he is the anointed one, the one that has been set apart and chosen for a special service and purpose. He is priest, prophet, and king. He's called our high priest. He is the prophet unto Moses, and he is the king. In fact, he is the king of kings and lord of lords. In fact, he was the long-awaited anointed king. The prophets of the Old Testament declared a king who would come and restore God's people. God even promised David a throne and a kingdom that would last forever. Jeremiah said, the scepter that shall not depart from him. To call Jesus the Christ is to call him the reigning king. And I'm afraid we may have missed it. Although Jesus is the Christ, repeatedly summarizes the gospel message of the scriptures, it is often absent from the gospel presentations that we give today. For to say that Jesus is the Christ or Jesus is the Messiah is to claim that he is a royally political figure, a human king, albeit a divine one too. And many struggle to make kingship the most basic gospel message. It's not immediately obvious to us how a bare affirmation like Jesus is king could be, in essence, such good news, but it is. And our gut reaction to all of this may be to say, well, what about salvation? What about the cross? What about forgiveness, the resurrection? Isn't that the most basic gospel message? Well, those are important. But we need to take the missing king seriously as a gospel problem. That term Christ, I'm afraid, has been reduced to a mere name, a personal identifier, a, an alternative way of referring to Jesus. In Christ alone, we sing in our songs or read in our theology textbooks. But to most Christians, Christ is just equivalent to Jesus. But to treat Jesus and Christ as equivalent terms is a mistake. Now, on the one hand, it is true to say Jesus saves and to say Christ saves. It's like saying Dylan is preaching and the preacher preaches, because that accurately reflects what I'm doing. But Dylan does not mean the same thing as preacher. And Jesus does not mean the same thing as Christ. Christ is comparable to the title, His Majesty if we are describing him as an English king. It is a special title designed to be one of renown. It is not his last name. Christ is the title for the universally significant Davidic king, and the failure to treat the Christ as the title has contributed to the problem. So what about salvation? What about forgiveness of sins? Well, without kingship, Forgiveness is not possible. Often in our haste to get what we so badly need, it causes us to forget and misunderstand how forgiveness is available. See, what is foremost in our mind when we consider the gospel is the transaction that happened on the cross. We see Jesus, a Savior, redeeming, atoning sacrifice, and Lamb of God, Oh, and yeah, he also has some vague authority as Lord, too. But we often fail to see that forgiveness flows not just through a person, but through a person in his official capacity as king. If he's not king, he can't give forgiveness. The king who was crucified, raised, and reigning can offer forgiveness. While serving as king at God's right hand, he is also the high priest and the sacrificial offering that covers our sin. Jesus' forgiving power 
cannot be separated from his royal authority as head of his people. Do you see how important the kingship of Jesus is? It was crucial to the apostles' message. It was the gospel that was first delivered unto the saints. It is the gospel that we should still be preaching. The gospel is not just about Jesus' saving work. It is about his kingdom reign. So I'm wondering, what kind of gospel have you been preaching? Have you been leaving out the kingship of Jesus? Have you been offering his forgiveness, but not telling about his lordship? Preach Jesus as the Christ, as the king. Tell of how he became king through his death, burial, and resurrection. Tell of how he reigns even now as king at the right hand of the Father. And tell of how he will reign forevermore as king of kings and lord of lords. You know, at his birth, the angels announced the gospel. Luke 2, 11, for today in the city of David, there has been born for you a savior who is Christ the Lord. The sign that would posted above his head at his crucifixion, although in mockery, actually told the gospel. The sign read, Jesus of Nazareth, King. The confession of faith is that Jesus is Lord. He's King. And Revelation describes what it will be like at his return in chapter 19, starting in verse 11, I saw heaven open, John says, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many crowns. And he has a name written on him, which no one knows except himself. He's clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty, and on his robe and on his thigh he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. A lot of people want Jesus as their Savior, but not many want him as their Lord. They want the blessings of the kingdom, but they're not willing to make him their king. But that's not the gospel. That's not the gospel message of the scriptures, at least. That's not the gospel that the apostles preached. The gospel, the pure, true gospel, is that Jesus is the Christ. The gospel you preach determines the disciples you make. So preach this gospel message. Jesus is the Christ, and you'll get disciples of Jesus. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for that good news that your son, Jesus, he is the king. And we are your heralds who get to go about this world with trumpets blaring and proclaiming that there's a new king in charge, that he has defeated our enemies, sin and death, that he is reigning at your right hand, and that he is coming again one day to restore and make all things new. Oh, what marvelous news. What good news that Jesus is the Christ. Lord, let us share that gospel without hesitation, without shrinking back. Let us stand firm on it, not sway or depart from it, but be faithful and true to preach the message that was first delivered unto the saints, the message that Jesus is the Christ. 
I pray for these brothers. Pray that you bless them in their ministry and their work. Many of them who are laboring in the gospel while also continuing in their education. Pray that you give them strength and endurance. Pray that you bless their families. I pray for the disciples that they will make as they work and labor for you. Above all, I pray that they would stay committed to you, Lord, and that they'd be faithful to the work of ministry. Lord, we love and praise you. We thank you for LBC and its devotion to training preachers to preach in Christ's church. And all this we pray in the name of Jesus, our risen Lord. Amen. Thank you.